Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's session on addiction. Um, I think it's a bit of a different topic than what we've been used to. Um, a lot of us will usually um, have webinars around, you know, resilience and stress management and burnout and a lot of the challenges that have stemmed out of our ongoing pandemic. Um, for me, this topic is something that applies to all of us, really. Um, I think we see it in our spaces, um, but we don't often tackle it head on. So I'm really hoping that we will have a few key takeaways on being able to identify um, the different aspects that surround the addiction factor. Um, and also just, you know, if there are any questions that we'd like to pose um, in order to support ourselves, our inner circle, family members, colleagues, um, people that we know that might be struggling with addiction or dependency, um, please do feel free and you can always use the chat um, and I will leave a little bit of time at the end for Q&A to enable us to just address those questions. Um, if you're wondering who I am, my name is Gifty Nyaka and I am a Corporate Wellbeing Facilitator with ICAS International. Um, and I've also worked in the rehabilitation space. So this is a topic that is quite close to my heart. Um, I believe there is hope. There's always the possibility of ongoing recovery, even if you feel like, gosh, is there really anything that we can do? But hopefully as we unpack the topic and we have a greater understanding, um, we'll also have a general idea of what support looks like and how we can actually break that barrier of resistance that comes with addiction sometimes. All right, so first things first. Um, I think when we think of addiction and dependence, sometimes we cluster it into one thing, right? Um, but I do think that it's important to highlight this a bit of a fine line. Um, not sure if anyone here wants to hazard a guess, you can uh, respond in the chat. But what would you say um, is something that you might be dependent on, but not necessarily addicted to? Food for thought, right? So maybe start exploring that. Um, there are various things in our lives that I feel, you know, we, we really do have a dependence on, um, but might not necessarily have um, the psychological and behavioral, even the physical addiction on it, um, but we rely on it for our benefit in some way or it serves a function. Um, I'll just come back to the chat to see if there's anything coming through. So I'll just ask Kirsty to be on alert if any um, responses come through. Um, but while we wait for those responses, um, addiction tends to be seen as any activity or substance or behavior that becomes a major focus, right? So it really starts to take a bit of a center stage um, and it can actually cause um, harmful effects. Um, but somehow, in spite of that, we tend to continue, right? So there we are, um, there's this source of um, pleasure or happiness, or it's just out of habit, but we've cultivated a relationship and we tend to just rely on it. It doesn't matter what the consequences might be for some of us. Um, we get to a stage where, you know, we really have a bit of an unhealthy relationship with that particular thing. Um, and we kind of look at two types of dependence. There's the psychological behavioral where it's more about, you know, the mental need for it. And there's this sort of preoccupation. We plan, um, we anticipate, we look forward to um, the feeling that it might give us. Um, so it's really just more the wanting. You know, we talk about the intense craving. It's knowing that, oh, come the end of the weekend, I've got this thing to look forward to at the end of the week, rather, I've got this thing to look forward to or end of day. And um, we start almost planning how we're going to make that thing happen. Um, and if we don't have all the resources, you might find that there's quite a, a bit of intensive planning on how we are going to obtain whatever we need <laughs> to make it happen, right? So if maybe you are a shopaholic, um, 
and funds are a problem. We start thinking, gosh, what do I need to cut out in order to just get money from here? Who do I need to speak to or which credit card am I going to use? You know, there's, there's that sort of preoccupation. Um, your physical addiction, though, and I think that's where society kind of um, has that idea of addiction. We imagine um, that person might that might be sitting um, on a street corner somewhere um, that is maybe reliant on the the uh, need for illicit substances and things like that. Um, and there we speak about a physical dependency because there's a physical draw. It's almost like your body starts to go into withdrawal if that substance is not present. So it really varies. Um, Kirstie, is there anything coming through um, in terms of things that we might be dependent on but not necessarily addicted to? Thank you, Kirstie. Um, so far, my morning coffee has come through um, and everybody's like that. And I think that is winning for things we might be um, dependent on but not addicted to. OK. And, and then food and drinks um, are things that have come through as well. Yeah. I think sometimes we can get addicted to the drinks and the food um, and even the coffee. <laughs> I know people that will struggle with uh, headaches and you almost feel like you're withdrawing when you don't have your caffeine. But I think we can all identify with that feeling of just needing a boost to start the day. Um, but we don't necessarily rely on it in that you've got to take copious amounts and multiple, multiple cups throughout the day. Um, and for me, coffee would fall into one of those um, socially accepted um, type of drugs. I mean, when we speak about drugs, or we rather use the term um, drug of choice or substance of preference, you can call it what you will, it really is different. Um, an example for me of something you might really just be dependent on, but not necessarily addicted is things like your chronic bits. You know, um, if I am on high blood pressure medication. I'm dependent on it. It helps me to regulate my blood pressure, um, but I'm not necessarily addicted to it. There isn't planning. There isn't this preoccupation. Um, I'm not, you know, uh, uh, causing havoc in order to get my hands on it and so forth. Of course, there are other things like maybe insulin where um, it does help your body and without it, there will be, you know, there could potentially be consequences that are quite harmful. Um, but I think we can all see that there are things that we really are dependent on on an ongoing basis. So when we look at your physical addictions, like I said, there's a lot of socially acceptable substances, eh? Um, and maybe just looking at the pictures, <laughs> we've got our beers, we've got our wine, um, cocktails. Um, there's also, you know, energy drinks, which I think are very high in caffeine. And there are people that um, are constantly on that tap um, at drinking multiple cans a day. Um, in spite of you know the, the the palpitations and all the physical physical effects that it might have, um, but for me, your socially acceptable substances tend to be a lot more difficult to manage because it's prevalent, it's around us. Not everybody is necessarily dependent, so it's so easy um, to hide in plain sight, if you will, even when you've gone past the acceptable way of um, utilizing those um, substances. So we might all appreciate a glass of wine or a beer or a cocktail, um, but of course it's important to identify when um, it is to just enhance whatever it is that we're doing. And um, some people refer to alcohol, for example, as a social lubricant. Um, it gets us sociable and engaging and, you know, loosens us up and so forth versus where it's becoming a problem. We'll talk about that, you know, how to pick where we are. Um, Nicotine is also socially acceptable. Um, there's a lot of us that are dependent on cigarettes, on um, nicotine patches, gum. Um, there's now the vaping culture where it's more liquid and, you know, um, there's always nuances around should we, should we not. But it's really important to know that we are surrounded by a culture of addiction. Um, and we'll also talk about the other parts. But with your illicit drugs, it tends to be the things that society generally frowns upon 
on and where you almost need to source via back door. Uh, you might be looking at the um, marijuana leaf there. And I know in different spaces, you know, it is allowed, it is legal, there's a CBT, um, uh, uh, CBD, sorry, um, industry, if you will, that 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 is uh, really just um, emerging. Um, and usually the addictive components are taken out, but you, you do have um, still a calming effect, a swing. So it really is dependent on where you are at and how your environment views these substances. But of course, you can't necessarily um, use any of these substances and work. You know, so it would still be illicit. <laughs> um, we've got also a lot of over the counter type of medicines that can be a little bit addictive. There are some strong painkillers that might not necessarily be um, at the back of the counter where you need a prescription, but it does um, cause a dependence. And in some spaces, um, there are technically, I mean, you can call it a bit of a a mini pandemic at play where people are dependent on certain over the counter um, meds, um, also prescription meds, especially your pain meds, um, can really be dependent um, creating because we are getting rid of something that's uncomfortable and we trigger our reward center. So Generally, all of these things come in different classifications, if you will. Um, you've got your depressants, which doesn't necessarily mean that it makes you depressed. It rather just depresses your central nervous system. So um, I think we've all seen a drunk person or you may have seen somebody on something like heroin um, nodding out. That's a term that we use where um, they might look like they're falling asleep a little bit and they're very um, drowsy or they're, they're, there's um, the eyes are closing, they're slow, um, slowed speech, limited movement. Um, and then you've also got stimulants that do the opposite. They rather um, speed up everything and you might spot, you know, dilated pupils, um, a lot of talkativeness, this unnatural energy, unnatural confidence. Um, sometimes people really just having copious amounts of energy where they don't require sleep, they might not require food. Um, and then you've got your hallucinogens, which are the things that sort of make you trip, um, where this, you know, uh, um, seeing things that are not necessarily there, sometimes hearing voices, but it's usually visual. Um, People have commented about seeing air particles, being able to see them moving. Um, sometimes everything is bright and shiny and rainbows. Um, I think we can all sort of get the appeal. And all of these substances really just give us a dopamine rush and a dump in our system that is hard to acquire in our day to day life, um, where they really just it feels like it numbs pain. Um, it feels like we don't have to deal with some of the issues that we have, you know, like our general reality. Um, it transports us into a different space. Some people love how sociable they become or the fact that they no longer feel uncomfortable or distressed. Um, some are just really dependent on the social edge that it gives them. And we have people that might be working, but that might be dependent on things like cocaine, which is a stimulant, um, in order to just give them that social edge and the confidence um, or be able to push long hours. So we might feel that these things are so far from us. And, you know, if you are dependent on drugs, you're probably living under a bridge somewhere or you're standing at, a, at an intersection with a, a, a signboard. Um, but it's not necessarily the case. We've got high levels of alcohol dependence in our society, nicotine. We've got people that are on illicit drugs, um, but who might cover it so well um, that we tend to make excuses or just minimize the problem. Um, and it's important to know that a lot of these things are, I mean, it's not 
classified to one group of people. Um, we are all on a continuum, if you will. Uh, we all start at level one, which is the abstinence level, where you know we haven't really indulged in a substance before. Um, and then we tend to move to experimentation where we might try for the first time. Um, think of teenagers, maybe somebody might sneak a bottle of alcohol. Um, and we tend to think these things don't happen, but they do. Um, and people might take a sip or somebody who's now um, gathered their independence, a young adult thinking, oh, you know, smoking has always looked so cool. Let me give it a try. Or people at a party and someone says, yeah, try this pill, you know, um, and that might be the first time we use. And it's experimentation because we can decide from there whether we really just want to um, go back to that substance or not. Um, but a lot of people do continue because the the reward center is so stimulated. You know, that's how we are designed as people. If something comes with a good feeling, your brain tells you, "Ooh, that was lovely. We want more. So there are people who might be like, gosh, that is not for me. I felt uncomfortable. I felt I couldn't um, control myself. I don't like that feeling. Um, some people are quite unfortunate. Their first experimentation, they might use too much than what their body can handle. And then, um, you know, there's a lovely swing from for a few minutes, then it becomes quite uncomfortable and distressing. So depending on our experience, there are those of us that will proceed or not. Um, level three is usually your occasional use, you know, where now and again, um, maybe if I'm going out to meet up with friends, um, there might be a bottle of wine, or if um, there is a lovely event that's happening, a wedding, um, any sort of celebration, um, one of the key things that we tend to see around is alcohol. Um, so that occasional use might be on a social level. But level four is regular use, which I think a lot of us are on. We classify this as misuse because there isn't necessarily an event. Um, it's not like there is, you know, something that we are celebrating or we've met with a group of people. Um, regular use could be I'm alone, it's the end of my day, and I just think, gosh, a good glass of wine would do me good. Or let me pour myself a glass of whiskey. Um, and when you look at illicit drugs, for example, somebody might go from popping a pill um, at a party to actually just, um, you know, maybe even changing the drug of choice, um, moving towards something else and actually regularly seeking that swing, you know, the mental preoccupation and then actually going ahead with it. Um, the abuse stage and the addiction stage, for me, the abuse stage is where we start to really see consequences at play. Um, money, time, planning, family, social, work, um, sometimes putting ourselves in risky behaviors, but it just feels like, look, this is what it is. I enjoy this life. Um, and in spite of the warning signs or indicators and the adverse effects it might bring, we continue, right? Um, and then when we get to level six, which is dependency, this is where it becomes challenging because now the body has almost um, made that drug of choice um, a part of its operation. And the way I like to describe it is, you know, we've all got an embedded sort of chemical regulation that makes us feel well. Um, where imagine that you require a cup of happy juice that allows you to wake up in the morning, um, get dressed, get about your day, even if it's a really demanding time, difficult. It doesn't mean you're 100% functional, but generally we feel we've got the energy and the effort um, and just a general sense of well-being to face our day. Now, what tends to happen with especially illicit substances or anything that we can create a dependency on, including things like alcohol, nicotine, um, is as we start introducing on a regular basis um, this dopamine inducing, um, happy juice stimulating substance, your body tries always to um, center itself or strive for homeostasis, which is just, you know, that balance. Um, and what this means is it starts to recognize, gosh, there's excess. If I'm producing a cup 
and there is excess coming from the outside, I need to stop producing a cup. You know, let me reduce my production of your well-being substances or chemicals that are inherent because we're expecting it from the outside. And as we expect it from the outside, um, and the body sort of reduces its um, natural production, when the substance from the outside is not there, you feel worse, right, than usual. And so we tend to up the intake. We either switch from beer to a harder liquor, or the frequency with which we take it is more, or the amount that we are taking is more to try and achieve the same sort of swing. Um, and, and then, you know, the cycle continues. The more we introduce, the less our body produces and so forth until we become entirely dependent on utilizing that external um, drug of choice to be functional because without it, you're not functional. That's where uh, withdrawal comes. It's almost like you're starving your body of oxygen, you know, and there's this screaming pain, um, uh, from the body to say, please, we need this. Um, and the behaviors that usually result in making sure we bring in that substance at all cost is a little bit challenging. Okay, so how to identify whether you might be sitting in the, you know, okay zone, acceptable zone, um, where you're still functional regulating, or whether you might be on a path towards um, becoming a dependent um, drinker, um, I think it's important to just have an idea of what that looks like in a practical sense. Um, so the green zone is where you are classified as relatively okay, but even if you think about it from an alcohol perspective, um, 14 to 21 units per week is on average three units a day, you know, um, which is quite a bit. So if every day you're having um, three beers, it might be quite a bit, especially during the week, but it's still something that can be regulated um, up until four. Now, heavy drinking is generally where we start to see six or more units, right? So um, maybe after a work day, you crack open a six pack and um, you have that. Um, on weekends, you might up it a little bit or um, find that when this is a special event, there might be more units. Remember, this is the average. Um, and there might be days where there are a little bit less because we don't have time or there are other things that are keeping us occupied. But generally, it's um, you start to see there's always that availability. It's always there in the fridge or we're always ready to make a trip um, to go and stock up on our alcohol. Um, problem drinking, we tend to see a lot of consequences, 79 units a day, um, and the dependency tends to be 10 and above, but you don't, it's not neat. Please remember, um, it doesn't have to be, oh, I'm only on seven, therefore I don't have a problem. If you struggle to function, if there is that mental preoccupation, if you suspect there's a problem, if we're diverting funds or we really plan our day around making sure that we do get to that substance, it might not be 10 units, um, but it certainly is something to be mindful of. Um, and it's important to know that uh, dependency on in particular is classified as um, a medical condition. So nothing to be ashamed of. Um, the same way that we treat other medical conditions like depression, like anxiety, like um, uh, um, diabetes or high blood pressure, there are resources that enable us to actually support a person and, um, you know, rehabilitate and give them an opportunity to get rid of all the excess um, substance that's in their system and start to regulate their own chemical. Um, but of course, there's also a lot of learning that needs to take place in terms of how to deal with pain and stress and so forth. So it's on a continuum. We can all get there given certain behaviors being repeated. Um, and it's important that we take away the judgment and the taboo aspect and also understand there are certain components like our genetic makeup, our life circumstances, you know, there, there are so many factors that can get into play. Um, it's not just about somebody being ill disciplined and just wanting to drink excessively, because that's usually the conversation that we have. Um, where we might also just 
be able to identify with a bit is your behavioral addictions. And perhaps you've been looking at this list. Maybe we can just reflect a little bit and highlight which ones we've seen in our spaces. You know, the question isn't so much what are you experiencing, but just in our community or when you look around you, um, which behavior addiction tends to be quite prevalent? And I do feel as a society, we've got this culture of the rush, the stimulation. Uh, we're very impulsive. We like things now. Um, and we really do tend to have dependencies, even if we don't like to acknowledge it. So behavioral addictions are things that we can be addicted to and get high on it. You know, we get this rush, but it's not necessarily drugs. And gambling is one of the addictions that um, it really does cause problems. We've seen people using everything, um, but they can't seem to get away from, you know, the casinos and sometimes informal gambling events, um, backdoor poker and things like that. Um, there's also sex addiction where people might have a whole secret lifestyle because um, there's this taboo, we don't like to talk about it. There are people that are addicted to porn um, and they'll spend a lot of hours um, watching pornography. There are people that are dependent on the internet. And I think if I'm to make it a bit more <laughs> Uh, specific, the social media aspect of the internet. Um, those of us that browse a lot, we're always on some sort of social media platform, lots of uploads, lots of liking. Um, we've got this whole life and persona on social media, or you might be constantly watching things on YouTube, um, sometimes just Googling and diagnosing yourself or <laughs> trying to get as much information as you can. Um, there's that lovely term, shopaholic. So we've got people that really do rely on retail therapy and you can almost feel that itch coming in as you're having a difficult week like, oh my goodness, I really want to get myself a lovely pair of shoes or I can't wait to go and splurge on whatever it might be and it gives us this rush. Um, video game addiction is quite prevalent and it's a lot more impactful than we think. Um, it can be extreme to the point that people go for days without sleeping because they're in a live game. Um, there are people that will go as far as putting on adult diapers, um, having a food station next to them, um, putting on a catheter. It's extreme. Anything to make sure that I don't move. Um, and I might have several days where I just have not rested. I'm taking stimulants to keep myself going. I don't leave my room um, and I might lose my job. I might lose my social um, support structure and connecting meaningfully because I live in this world of gaming. Um, you can also imagine usually people buy skins and other things to um, impact the game. So there tends to be um, quite dire consequences to a lot of these things that we're talking about, the behavioral addictions. Plastic surgery, we've heard of people starting with a rhinoplasty or maybe uh, what we call a nose job. And then oh, I'm getting my eyebrows done, then it's a facelift, then I'm getting implants and, and so forth. And people almost become addicted to the thrill of um, being able to look different. Sometimes it starts with a lot of compliments and as time goes, it might be that there's this distorted view. Some people have what we call body dysmorphia where um, they see themselves and they see a bit of a distorted image and they, they continue to try and strive for perfection, even though the rest of us might see them looking okay. Um, they might think, gosh, no, my nose is too big or um, I need to tuck in my chin and things like that. Um, cutting, you know, self-harm can also be addictive because people have this rush that they feel when they see the blood flowing, they feel alive. Um, some people say to you that they're numb and the only time they feel alive is when they're cutting. And then of course, you've got your um, risky behavior, your adrenaline junkies where we're jumping off things and we're always going for um, extreme type of behaviors to just get that adrenaline rush and we live for it. But a few risk factors, you know, I did mention that um, there are certain aspects that might contribute towards um, creating a dependency. Um, sometimes the availability 
a lot of the things that we are dependent on as people is really available. Internet, Wi-Fi, really available everywhere. Alcohol, cigarettes, really available. Um, perfectly, you know, um, socially acceptable. And it, it, it makes it easy to downplay what is actually happening. Um, sometimes people's families don't realize how dependent a person might be because maybe they're always out. It almost seems like it's always seems like it's social use um, until the social side falls away and then you realize, oh my goodness, it's actually um, there is a dependence here. You know, seeking an outing is not necessarily I'm not going for the outing um, it, it allows me to get drunk or get high and that's what I'm seeking um, sometimes social pressures we've got peer pressure um, there are people who might make comments on the fact that oh my goodness um, you don't drink and so forth but we also have um, social pressures like just life that we deal with where at times it's not acceptable to moan or to complain, um, you have to be macho, you have to be tough. Um, and people might just resort, uh, resort to other things to cope. Um, usually things like difficulty in normal relationships where we don't really have that good bond and we feel a void and we try and fill in the void um, with illicit substances or anything that gives us that swing or numbs us. Um, sometimes freedom, you know, um, especially when people are getting into adulthood and then are free, um, you might find that they go on a bit of a binging streak. And if you're not careful, we can actually, um, you know, uh, get into the dependency bracket because addiction is gradual. We don't just wake up addicted. Um, we also see the changes in income. There are very low income areas where there tends to be a lot more social pressures. And with that, there's exposure to um, substances and sometimes just that dependency on it. Um, and also very high income, sometimes just excess money, a party lifestyle. We don't really realize the consequences because this this limit unlimited funds um, and we also do see that genetically some of us are more inclined to heading towards dependency much faster than others um, they've seen this with twin studies they've also seen that with um, families you know I might be dependent on gambling and I gave birth to a child that might not be dependent on gambling but their dependency might surface in something else. So it's not necessarily if I'm addicted to food, my child will be addicted to food or people in my family. I could be addicted to alcohol. Somebody else could. It could be food. It could be exercise. It could be internet. But the wiring and the amount of pleasure response um, from a genetic perspective tends to be a lot higher than the average person. So your pleasure experience might be more um, heightened than mine because of your genetic underpinnings and your biological makeup. So how to pick up if somebody is um, generally, um, you know, in the dependency space? Um, usually you might start to see changes to behavior. A lot of people might pick up that there is a problem or family, friends, uh, colleagues might make a comment and then we start to try and cover it, try and minimize it, um, sometimes avoidant behavior so that you don't see how bad it is or how severe it has become. Um, but you might spot changes to physical appearance, um, neglecting self-care, hygiene. Um, for example, if I am in the problematic or dependent drinking space uh, stage and I am passing out everywhere and when I wake up, you know, the first trigger, because remember there's no physiological, physical dependency, is, oh, get something in your body. I'm not thinking, please sit down, have breakfast, uh, take a shower. My immediate need is to feed that craving. And I'm experiencing withdrawal. I want to shut down that withdrawal. Withdrawal is very, very uncomfortable. Um, and so if it means setting aside all other things in my quest to shut down that withdrawal and to go to a place where I feel functional because independence, we stop using to for pleasure, we start using to function, um, then 
other things tend to take a backseat. So you might see disinterest in usual activities. Uh, a lot of my resources, my energy is going towards my my um, seeking behavior. Um, shutting out people, shutting out certain people that might be a problem or gravitating a problem in that they might stop us, have a lot to say and gravitating towards people that might be a bit more accepting and unfortunately tends to be other people that are um, also dependent, you know, in some instances. I might band with that person that doesn't um, tell me I'm drinking too much and actually does it with me. Um, also, sometimes defensiveness when the topic comes up, you know, just being overly reactive, uh, very defensive, pushing back sometimes, using emotional blackmail. Um, there might be times where a person will have memory lapses because they're caught so high or drunk um, and they struggle to concentrate during the, 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 the day. Um, changes to behavior, we start to see certain values falling away, especially when we are dependent. I might lie about what why I need the money. I might be secretive on in, in terms of how much I have. So I might start um, saying I had a salary card. Um, as well, that hasn't really happened. Um, so dishonest behavior might start creeping in. And this is where I think the taboo forms where people feel addicts are in a certain way, but the need to feed the habit will usually result in certain behaviors coming up in order to be able to get away from you or get money out of you or get you to leave me alone. Um, and so it's not that our person is lost, but those behaviors are or could be a part of allowing them to um, just keep withdrawal at bay and to keep the habit going. Um, we also see difficulty in sleep and other factors, but generally I think we can agree that um, physical addictions are quite harmful. Um, a lot of these substances do have a side effect and ongoing use or unregulated use tends to be um, you know, very hard or harsh on the body. So health issues tend to be um, triggered by ongoing use. Um, most of these things require money. <laughs> Uh, and so the financial aspect is felt. We see it in the family. We see it in relationships. Sometimes um, intimate relationships, marriages will really just take a knock because finances are being diverted towards um, different things that are not necessarily a priority. Um, there tends to be a bit of shame and guilt and remorse, especially when people realize that they are now dependent because they probably didn't envision themselves there. Um, there tends to be um, this shame. Maybe my family has said very hurtful things or um, I just feel I could do better. Um, and generally, you might find that work also tends to take a knock. Um, of course, if you do things that are safety critical, you tend to be a lot more accident prone. Um, and in some instances, one does lose their job. But um, there's this uh, statistic that 70% of people with a dependence are actually still working. It's about 30% that are not. So a lot of us are still in the workplace trying to um, manage it in some way, but it is a problem and there are or there might be some consequences. Um, I spoke about the family impact. I think relationships really do take a knock when we're dealing with addiction. Um, and there also tends to be um, the shame, the taboo aspect from a work perspective. We see higher levels of absenteeism and presenteeism. You know, um, absenteeism is where you're not in the space, but presenteeism is where you're there, but your mind is not. You think about other things, you're distracted, uh, lower performance and so forth. Um, and our mood tends to change. Um, there tends to be other disciplinary or misconduct factors. So the key thing is what can you do to manage addiction? Um, Kirsty, just wondering what came in when I asked about, you know, the, the um, key behavioral or social type of addictions that we see um, and then we'll talk about what we can do to manage it. Thanks Heidi, I'm going to take that one. Um, there were a couple of interesting questions. The first one was um, what do we mean by a unit when you were talking about alcohol? So I think that is 
a, a great question. Um, and then in addition to that, we had um, a comment or qu a question around social media. Um, and I think you have partially addressed that already. So this sort of idea of FOMO or, you know, this external stimuli driven sort of wanting to be in the know all the time, would yeah. that be considered an addiction? Um, and then also there was a really interesting question around whether overindulgence or emphasis on your career can be considered addictive. Yes. OK, so let's start with the um, social media and the FOMO and always wanting to be wired and in the know. Absolutely. There's preoccupation there. You might find that your fingers reach for your phone even when you don't need to. Um, I'd like you to try and track how many times you touch your phone and just open a page, even if you don't need to necessarily. Um, as, to, as soon as we have some free time, we're there. Um, and those of us that are very active on social media, we post, we comment, we question. I've seen comment wars um, and I always wonder, geez, people actually do have time and we take this world very seriously, um, the world of social media. Um, the question usually is, if you were to cut it out, would you be OK and functional? And if the answer is I would probably be uncomfortable or not really OK, then I think we need to um, say we are um, a little bit dependent, you know, so that's something to be um, mindful of. Uh, what was the second question, Kerry? Um, the second question was around your career and whether there is whether it's possible to be addicted to to that sort of idea of career and profession. Yes, so we've got what we call workaholics and our thrill comes from that well done or that closing the deal or that gunning for a promotion and the power that we feel um, there's cause and effect, there's stability, you feel like an expert in your zone. Um, and there are times where we will chase that feeling um, at the detriment of our health, of our families, of our rest, um, losing sleep, um, preoccupation with how we're going to impress or how we're really just going to get to the next step. Um, and we are really seeking a thrill. So again, it doesn't have to be hard and fast, you know, of um, when I'm not working, I'm, I'm not OK. But you will find that a lot of the underlying um, psychosocial aspects are there. Um, family issues, impact on self, neglect, deteriorating in certain aspects, relationships. Um, we do whatever we can to just get that powerful feeling of, you know, my career is really moving and I'm getting recognition for it. I'm hoping I've addressed everything. Great. Uh, Giffy, I think the only remaining thing was just that question around a, a unit of alcohol and sort of how we define that. Brilliant. So a unit will be dependent on what it is that you're having. Um, a, a, a pint, a, a glass of beer or a bottle of beer would be one unit of beer. Um, but imagine if we poured a bottle of um, if we poured whiskey into a beer uh, bottle, <laughs> that wouldn't be one unit. So that would be like a shot. Um, a cup of coffee, a unit would be a cup. You know, a glass of wine would be a unit, not a bottle. So please don't think, yay, I can go and get, you know, three two litre bottles and it's only three units. Um, it's a glass and we're talking the standard small glass. So depending on what the substance is, a unit would be one dose technically, and one dose of beer is a bottle, one dose of um, wine is a glass and so forth. Thanks, Giffy. And there is also a link in the chat um, to an article that might be helpful. Brilliant. Defining those units. Brilliant. All right, so generally, question is, how do we actually beat this um, culture of addiction? And the first thing is we need to know that there's a problem and we need to commit that we're going to do things differently. So actually taking responsibility, taking ownership um, and saying, I've noticed that this thing is consuming my life or it's starting to have adverse effects. So a lot of people have commented. Um, and I also note that I might not be able to beat it by myself. So let me get um, maybe a support structure or people that can just 
um, buddy up with me and we go through the journey together and they can keep me accountable and motivated and so forth. Um, and I always find that when you're trying to change a habit, you can't just sit there and be redundant. You, you have gotten accustomed to having something as a fella. So if you're maybe on the social media aspect or internet shopping, um, any time that you've got some free time, it's, oh my goodness, let me see what's here. And you can't then expect yourself to magically be comfortable sitting there twiddling your thumbs. It helps to have a distraction. It helps to actually have something that you bring into that time that you would have used so that there's an alternative. Um, of course, with physical addictions, even if you're busy, cravings, the pull is really, really intense. I mean, depending on the drugs, things like heroin addiction, uh, withdrawal, for example, uh, a person could end up in a hospital. It's that severe. It's lacking sleep, palpitations, it's vomiting, you're shivering, you're hot, then you're cold, and it feels like your joints are being sliced up. I am actually talking from not personal experience, but like what patients have shared with me that this is what you experience, and we see it. Um, but of course, with other things where the withdrawal isn't that big, like maybe shopping or, you know, um, the, the, the intense craving to go and gamble, your uh, uh, behavioral addictions. It really just helps to have an alternative thing. Um, exercising also produces um, endorphins, which is your body's natural painkiller, which can give us a sense of well-being. It helps us to also sleep better, which can help with, you know, just the restoration, the healing, the chemical balance aspects, especially serotonin, which is a mood regulator. Um, starting a project, having something to look forward to. Um, and another thing that is really, really helpful is actually doing acts of service, volunteerism, fighting for a cause. Usually it does give us a bit of a rush um, when we are able to give of ourselves and we feel like we are um, really just contributing meaningfully in other people's lives. So making certain changes that set us up for success. Um, but of course, there's always the professional intervention, especially when we hit dependence, where it's more useful to get into a rehabilitation facility, be given in rehab, what usually happens is you're regulated, you're given medication to minimize the withdrawal, especially for your um, physical addictions. And then there's a lot of psychotherapy around learning to pick up on triggers, understanding that it's on a continuum, that a person can relapse at any time. Uh, you might go back to old behaviors. You might be a recovering alcoholic and you haven't touched alcohol in three years, but every day you're surrounded by it. Or there could be, you know, a family that really, a partner even, sometimes a, a spouse that is not willing to get rid of alcohol in the house. And there's always that trigger. And usually all it takes is, you know, just one sip or saying, oh, I'm sure I can. Um, and then we start to gradually move along those stages again. Um, and usually when we are already classified as dependent, it doesn't it doesn't take very long for us to move uh, um, on the uh, along those stages. We might go from clean, active, everything is back to normal work, finances, family. Um, and within a couple of weeks or short months, we find ourselves back at um, the, the highest level. So generally, other things that we can do is just making sure we have as much information as possible on some of the behaviors that we um, engage in for ourselves, for our kids. Um, we really are creating a culture of social media in our society. COVID hasn't helped driving us into remote spaces. Everything's becoming virtual now. Um, so there's a lot of indicators or signs around us and risk factors. Um, and it's very important that we are mindful of that. Um, it's also important that we are able to make sure we're physically well. So we eat well, we sleep well, we hydrate, we build our resilience. We learn to manage our stress on the go as it comes um, to avoid getting into that space where we rely on something else to quickly and 
almost automatically whip us out of that distress because that's where we start to really just feel like, gosh, that was good. I need to get back there again. Um, and I think if you want to help somebody, maybe like family, friends, um, it's just important to have an idea that this is not about morals. I'm not talking to a liar. I'm not talking to a thief. I'm not talking to a lazy person. I'm talking to an individual whose condition or dependency has resulted in them lying. And one thing that I used to love that we'd, um, we, we would do at rehab was to get people to name their addiction and say, stop calling yourself gifty, the junkie or whatever. Um, I'm a gifty and I happen to be dependent. And we call the addiction a different name to you because with it comes so many value breaking type of behaviors that tend to shock the people around us and and then there's just this cutting or ostracizing but what we need to do is actually reach in understand that a person would rather fight you and resist you in order to stay where they are because the pain or the distress especially with physical addiction when they try and stop is just too much and so the conversation you're having is not, you know, oh, be tough, stop using drugs. It's more, I know that I'm asking you to go through maybe a week because usually withdrawal is about five to seven days, a week of feeling like you're dying in order to start building a lifetime of health. And that's where we really draw that connection. And you've got to be firm. So you can speak to a therapist, you can have counseling, you can find out how best to approach. Some people have interventions, especially with physical addiction, um, where they share their love for the person and the bag is packed and they say, please come into rehab and they take you. Um, the recovery rate is relative and it tends to be dependent on how long a person gets professional support for. So the longer you are in rehab in a halfway house, Speaking to a sponsor who is somebody who's also an addict in recovery but is clean or they're no longer using their drug of choice um, or go to NA, which is Narcotics Anonymous, AA Alcoholics Anonymous, other support groups and so forth. Um, working your steps, there's a 12 step program, there is really feeding into your higher power. All of those things give you a higher chance of staying clean for longer. But the shocking statistic is that on average, people will relapse, you know, more than seven times before they get to a point where they are clean for a prolonged period. And by relapse, I'm no longer using my drug of choice. Something happens and I go back to it. And the key thing is we say relapse is a part of recovery. When you get there, it's OK. If your family member gets there, it's OK. We just help them to get back into their recovery program. Um, and work as a team, you know, um, also make sure that there is accountability, there is ownership. Um, don't be emotionally blackmailed into stepping away from trying to support, but we also need to be mindful that um, there needs to be willingness and acceptance that there is a problem on the part of that person with a dependency for support to really help. OK, so there's a whole bunch of things that we can do. Um, and I think with the Internet addiction, the, the question that came up, you know, um, social media and so forth, there's also other things. There's the cyber sexual where there's a lot of Internet porn or just constantly getting onto the web with your net compulsions to browse, to shop, to see how the stock market is doing. Um, some people will just go for the relationship aspect, you know, wanting to see their buddies and so forth. Other people more gaming and information seeking. So we do have um, a dependency on the Internet. I think I did mention that the accessibility and the excitement that it presents means that uh, many of us are quite reliant on it. And in order to try and minimize that, try and have digital detoxes where maybe you're not touching any digital uh, device. Um, try and take breaks, you know, where you step away or give yourself tasks that don't include being online. Um, things like a walk, a hike. Like I said, it really is about just making sure there is something a bit more healthy 
and sustainable to use. And then, of course, you've got your employee assistance program that can help you with managing all of our different compulsions and addictions. Um, it is available to you 24 hours a day. Um, it's also available to our family members under our roof. So perhaps it's not you that is worried about your personal dependence or addiction, but rather um, worried about a family member. Um, if they are under your roof, you can actually consult. You can um, have a confidential engagement on what you're dealing with and how we can support you because circumstances are diverse um, and you really do um, need to know it is 100% confidential. Anything that we discuss stays with us. You can access the ICASLifestyle.com resources um, online um, and, and also just speak to your HR um, or your people team on how to access your specific toll free number because you do have an in country toll free a toll free number or helpline where you can speak to someone. All right. Um, not sure how much time we've got left. I did say I would address whatever questions come through. Uh, Kerry, please, would you let me know if there are any questions coming through so that I address it before we wrap up? Um, um, thanks, Gifty. There was a comment around meditative breathing and the role that that can play in settling down the dopamine highs. Mm -hmm. So I think perhaps if you want to comment on that. We also had a, a comment from someone about how they've managed to beat their sugar addiction through a four day fasting approach um, and, and really managed to cut sugar out from, from their diet. Um, and we've also had a, a a question around spa rehab centers and how effective that sort of approach might be in managing um, addiction. Yeah, um, well done on managing the sugar high. Sugar is highly addictive. I think even um, in nature, once um, nature finds sugar, they will always go back to the source, sugar and salt. Um, and a lot of our foods are really laced with sugar. Things that you wouldn't expect to have sugar in do. Um, <laughs> and as a society, we really do become quite dependent on it. So kudos to you for being able to fast through that. Um, I do think that um, it takes a little bit of time and practice. We need to be patient with ourselves um, and everything tends to be incremental. With regards to the spa rehabs, I think um, you've got to do what works for you. There are people who find a lot of value, um, especially if there are other things to focus on rather than just the addiction journey. Um, but it's good to be in an environment that is relaxing where you can ex express um, or um, experience a sense of well-being and relaxation outside of where you usually draw the source from. Um, and I also do feel that those of us that are quite dependent on the rush and the work and the aspect, <clears throat> those aspects, many of us don't actually know how to relax. So that's also another lovely part that you do learn to. Um, and in that way, I do find that it is quite um, good to be in that setting. Also, remember, it's usually in a group setup. Um, and because it's in a group setup, you get to um, touch base with people on a similar journey. Um, so I think it's a combination of factors. It's the relaxing se uh, setting. It's learning to associate pleasure with something else. It's being surrounded by other people. Um, and of course, just being in an overall good and stimulating environment. Um, the other comment on dopamine as a way to just control uh, using breathing to um, control the dopamine rush. I agree. Deep meditative breathing sends a signal to your brain that all is well. We usually get that sort of deep breathing when we are in our sleep stages around stage um, two and three where your body is really shutting down for the night um, and your breathing gets lowered and your um, blood pressure drops, your temperature drops. Um, it's in a very heightened, relaxed state. And when we're getting into that state, one of the things the body tries to do for a good night's rest is to also just calm down anything that is overly exciting, stimulating, um, so that we can get off to sleep, you know, properly. So it can help with creating that calming effect and getting the heart rate down and lessening the rush that's going around the body. Um, so yes, definitely. 
Any other questions? Um, I guess you just one question around a sort of alcohol and and whether or not someone who is having heart issues, um, you know, how harmful would it be to to indulge in alcohol on a weekly basis? Um, I think for me, the issue is, is it excessive? You know, um, if you're having one beer um, and your doctor, if you've got a heart issue, uh, condition, chances are you have a treating professional. Um, touch base with them. If they say it's fine, um, then I don't see why not. But a lot of these substances, even with our depressants, you will find that your heart rate goes up. Okay, so there will always be that peak in heart rate. Um, so if your doctor feels maybe one unit is okay, go ahead for it. Um, if it is excessive, definitely not. <laughs> You know, we would try to um, be a bit more abstinent or really regulate control. But for me, key thing, speak to your treating professional and hear what they say. Thanks, Gifty. And I think just one one other comment was just around sort of the, I think the challenges of the pandemic and everybody being at home in one, in one space um, and how perhaps, you know, that additional pressure maybe has contri can contribute um, to us perhaps needing a glass of wine uh, rather than, than other ways of coping with that stress. Yes, a lot of our coping avenues have been taken away and most of us are going for things that are readily accessible and usually bottled. Um, <laughs> and we numb ourselves and we create a sense of just removing ourselves from the Groundhog Day reality or just dealing with our pressure in that way. So certainly there has been a, a drive towards almost creating a need more so now than before. I see that we've come to the top of the hour. Uh, just from me, a very big thank you for coming through. I understand people will have to head off to their other um, things that they have waiting for them. I really do hope that you took away something and that you've got a start point and you have a different understanding of addiction than perhaps what you walked in with. But you remember it can happen to anyone. It's on a continuum and there's always support available. So please do reach out and also be there to support your family members and friends that might need it. Have a great day further, everybody.